Welcome to Remnant Online Followers. Please kindly subscribe. Thank you. There are many persons who will never be mentored by anybody. They know it all. But anything they start doing does not work. Because knowledge will insist that until you have it, you will not make progress. And even ignorance will insist that you can't go anywhere until you have acquired knowledge. Meanwhile, these people that know nothing, they want to advise everybody. And the question is, you who wants to advise this businessman, what business are you doing? And what progress have you made? You who want to advise this bishop, how many churches have you pioneered? What process, what progress? He said, wisdom is justified by her children. Don't come to a place and speak English. Show your results. Your result is the authority you have to address matters. Knowledge. How much do you know about what God is showing you? If you don't know, then you are still in class one. Better allow yourself to be tilled through knowledge. Don't be in a rush. You have not known anything about the prophetic. God says you are a prophet. Before you start running, looking for invitation, make sure you have sharpened your tools. Because when they introduce you in that meeting as prophet, people are not looking for a teacher. They are looking for a man who can look into their problem and tell them prophetically. So don't come and start teaching when you are introduced as a prophet. They are looking for the present word of God for the now. And so when you are teaching, they are waiting for you to manifest. They say you are a prophet. Don't come and say you are a prophet and at the end of the day, the whole meeting becomes a prayer conference. They didn't invite an intercessor. They invited the prophet. So make sure you sharpen your tool and you are a prophet indeed. And if your tool is not yet sharpened, shut that invitation down and go back to the cave. If you don't pass through Adulam and you appear in the war field, your head will be cut off. I'm telling you, make no mistakes about it. Don't short, short circuit the process of acquiring knowledge for stardom and visibility. By the time God begins to raise you, either in business or in whatever field you take your you call your, your you are called to, you will know that every promotion demands that you subdue a challenge first. In fact, every promotion is a challenge in disguise. If you can't overcome that challenge, that promotion will disgrace you. That's how life works. And so in order not to be found wanting, make sure you pay the price for knowledge. That's what is required for the time of tilling. Number two, what is needed in the time of tilling? Focus. Nothing compares to focus. If you find a man who is ready for destiny, one of the ways you will know is his focus. He's about what he's doing. And that's what Jesus showed at the age of 12. He was in the temple. Every other child was gallivanting and playing. The man was about his business. And when the parents traveled, it was three days later, they discovered that he was not there. And they looked for him, came back to the temple, and he said, why are you looking for me? Don't you know that I should be about my father's business? At the age of 12, no wonder no man on earth has ever been like him. The level of focus and precision and tenacity at the age of 12 some don't have it at 50. so he is not just impactful because he's jesus the principles of god defined his life even from a tender age focus many persons are all over the place and that's why they cannot go anywhere in matthew 6 22 he said if your eyes be single he said then your whole body will be flooded with light your eyes be single in the western world they have understood the significance of focus and so when a child wants to be a footballer they take them to the academy sometimes from the age of five every day they must touch the ball every day that is training and mastering focus they play it all their lives and they they learn this value so much that when you go to their house everything is about football and the same thing applies to every champion in every corridor go and go to the house of a boxer you will see every corner you either see a gym or you see a punching bag he's doing everything to develop capacity and then you'll find the lecturer design his house like a bouncer because his strength and then you are wondering where are you going to what you should have is libraries and books because your environment reveals your focus when you find a man who is not focused it shows in his environment you come to the house of a preacher there's no personal room for prayer. There's no study room. And that preacher says he wants to be a voice to his generation. 
If you know him, tell him he's a joker. The reason many people lose their vision is because they lack focus. They are all over the place. They want to be like everybody. They want to do everybody, everything. That's why they are never productive. Even the world system knows that when you become a jack of all trade, you master none. So the second thing about Tilly is to discipline yourself. This world is too noisy. See, if you are a pastor, if you are online, don't go watching people who are doing beauty pageant. Don't go watching people who are arguing and debating politics. Sit only on messages. It will take a lot of power, focus power, to be able to restrain yourself like that. And then you are there watching what will improve you. If you are a businessman, sit down, study businessmen, watch their lives, watch what they do, watch what they say. Don't be all over the place. At least in the earliest phase of your life. It's called the tilling phase. Because that's when your personality is formed. And that's where the power of your spirit is developed. Focus. Many don't have focus. Some people in a day, they can carry out more than 50 different activities that are not connected. In one day, some persons. They can have more than 30 conversations that are not connected. And they say they are going somewhere. The life is scattered. And because of that, even the anointing of God in their soul, the energy of God in their spirit is diverged. And that divergence will cause them never to prosper in anything they do. Focus. The third thing about tilling is discipline. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he said, I beat myself. He's trying to use a very strong term to let you know that if he doesn't compare himself, even Paul, the great apostle, can wonder. So the reason he's about his cause is not because it's a gift. It's because he beat himself and brought himself under subjection. And when his time was over, he said, I have finished my course. I have run my race. He said, there remained for me a crown of life. He had too much precision because of how he lived his life. I beat myself. There are many places you tell yourself, I will not go there. And if you can't, you will call somebody, lock me in this room, carry the key, come tomorrow. If I have this key, I will go there. And because I can't keep myself here, lock me up here. Didn't you read the story of A.A. Allen? His time was passing. And A.A. Allen knew that if he doesn't break into the power dimension, something will go wrong. This ministry will fail. He gave his wife the key. He said, lock me in this room. Don't open until I tell you God has spoken to me. And it was from that room that a global ministry emerged. Focus. Discipline. Many don't have this. That's why although they are the most gifted, yet their life can be defined by mediocrity if you choose to be fair. You can't be an average person and impact your generation. You can't be an average person and lead your generation. When you find people making impact, go close to them. The discipline their life commands will eject you in one day. And can I tell you something? The higher the weight of your destiny, the stronger this requirement. But unfortunately, it is those who are not expected to do much that are even lazy around. The other time I went to a campus to preach and I was just led to interact with some of the students. Some psychology students were complaining. Sociology students complaining. And I said, how many courses are you doing? They said, seven courses. Where is your lecture note? One lecture note is 10 pages. And they fail more. Sociology, they fail more. Theater arts, they fail more. They come to they fail more. Go to engineering. Where they do all the calculation and crack their brain. That's where you have the highest results. You come for convocation most of the time. Engineering and medicine that are doing a 10 to 20 times the work that the other social science students or art students are doing. They are the ones who graduate as best students. And then you are thinking, these ones have harder work. They should be the ones failing. But you see, the greater the responsibility, the greater the awareness. Go to the class around 2 a.m. You will hardly find a sociology student reading. A select elect student, mechanical engineering student, medicine and surgery student that are there reading. And when exam comes, the guy who is reading anatomy textbook that is this big is the one who passes. Somebody whose lecture note is 10 pages. You will come to the board, you see E, F, E, F. When they have C, they say, Kai, thank God, we passed, we passed. I'm not talking down on the subject. I'm just using it to show you the laziness. Tilling, tilling, tilling. That's why many fail. Ah, time. Number two, in the protocol of productivity, is sowing. Because of time, I won't stress again. 
at the level of sowing, you are an investor in your vision. Before anybody else invests in your vision, you'll be the first to invest in it. It's when your investment in your vision begins to speak that others are attracted to it. So that's what sowing is about. And when you study this thing well, there are three things of great emphasis. Number one is timing. You need a lot of discernment to sow. To know what to sow and when to sow. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 17. Here is what the Bible says. This one requires a lot of discernment and precision. You don't just sow anything. There are certain crops that will not thrive on certain soil. So you must understand what crop to sow and what soil. And you must also understand what season to sow. Because you can't sow at every time. If you sow at certain times, the crop or the seed will decay. It's a specific time that you must sow. It says, so to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And as you read to verse 8, he will outline many purposes. But in verse 17, it's, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. He said, for there is a time for every purpose and for every work. The reason many fail is because they don't understand the soil of their destiny and they don't understand the season of sowing. So if somebody who is studying engineering decides to make friends with somebody who is studying theater art, he doesn't know the weight of his course. Because when the theater art student is dancing, he is reading. <laughs> That's how he is. When he's acting drama, he's studying very hard. Is dancing and acting. That is serious study. In fact, that is the climax of his study. That play is playing. That is serious reading. But you who is an engineer, you will have to prove the equation of 10 pages first before you apply the equation to solve problem. So you follow the theater student. You people are dancing. When the exam comes, you'll be stranded. Because you don't know the nature of your calling. You are a prophet and you are going to make friends with somebody who is a, a commentator. And the commentator is, he said, let's go to the football match. He's watching football. You are watching. You are... By the time the demands of destiny comes, the commentator will become wealthy. You will fail. Because while that commentator is watching football, you should be looking for the different pathways to the third heaven. Because what gives you authority as a prophet is your connection to the voice of Abba. And so if you cannot download signals from heaven, you will be stranded as touching your destiny. And so you should know when to do what. Having understood the weight of your destiny. Many people can call themselves apostles. Some apostles are sent to a family. Some are sent to a local government. If you know you are an apostle sent to your generation, you can't do what the guy who is sent to a local government is doing. Because the climax of that person's ministry is when the local government chairman comes for the meeting. And his b-board is everywhere and souls are one in the local government. You need to talk to somebody in Afghanistan. You need to talk to somebody in London. You need to talk to somebody in America. You cannot afford to live the way this person is living. So he can choose to sleep around 8. You will be awake till 1. Because you need a lot of sowing into this destiny. But you see, when people don't know the weight of their calling, they will miss the timing. Because they will assume that it must happen. It must not happen. David was supposed to manifest at 17. Meanwhile, Moses manifested at 40. If David goes and relax and say, well, even Moses the patriarch, it was at 40, God encountered him. He's finished. Goliath will kill him if he has the opportunity of meeting Goliath. But because David knew that his time of manifestation was 17, at the age of 15, he had killed the lion. At the age of 15, he had killed the bear because he doesn't have the luxury of time. Imagine when David manifested. He couldn't even wear the armor of the military generals. So don't allow anybody to define your journey for you. You are the one who knows what God told you. Because somebody may walk with Moses and then see David and say, David is ambitious. He has no idea where David is going to. David would meet his Goliath at the age of 17. Moses met Pharaoh at 80. At 80. I was even saying 40. 80. So if you walk with Moses and you assume it's at 80, people should manifest. You will never manifest. You will die. So for sowing to happen, you must master timing. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it said the sons of Isaac, they had understanding of times and seasons. It said they knew what Israel ought to do. It said the heads of them was 200, 
all their brethren was at their commandment so what gave isaka authority is the fact that he was a master of reading times and seasons and that is why everybody must understand that early to rise is early to shine but if you don't know the law of sowing you will sleep when you should slow and that's why i said a little sleep a little slumber a little sowing of the say, folding of the hand is a poverty will overtake you your want will come like an armed man we have different destinies we have different purposes different purposes i knew that what god wanted to do with my own life required a lot of speed so i invested in my life early even in my academic qualification career i finished degree immediately i came back from service i entered for masters as i finished masters before they gave us our result i applied for phd and i entered immediately i had to push because many destinies will follow the path that i'm carving and so i cannot allow delay to fall into that path because i knew where i was going don't relax destiny is too short and don't allow somebody else who manifested late become your frequent your your reference this is not an attempt for you to undermine process but it's a wake up call is he awake awake thou that sleepest and christ will give you light your light will come when you wake up and if you sleep until you are 80 your light will come at 80 then there'll be no strength but a man who decides to wake up at 15 he will handle light that people at 70 have not touched so it's at your disposal make your choice the second thing about sowing is sacrifice this is where capital investment takes place there are many persons who don't know the place of sacrifice so they eat what they should plant Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11 as the rain cometh down and returneth not but watereth the earth to give bread to the eater and seed to the sower so shall my word be which is gone forth out of my lips it shall not return to me void there are many persons who ate their bread and ate their seeds that's why they have no harvest anybody who wants to live a productive life must make sacrifice his way of life because sacrifice is the reason why you will sow what should be sown. There is a time of your day that must be sown as an investment into your vision. There is a time of your night that should be sown as an investment into your vision. There is amount of money you have that should be sown as an investment into your vision. I was walking in the street of worry. I had only 6,000 naira in my pocket. I saw somebody passing with Dr. Mais Moreau's book. I bought that book. I didn't even have transport to go back home. It looks stupid at the time. But today when we talk, you hear kingdom. It's not a gift alone. Some of them came from many years of using our money to buy those books. Ask those who know me. Those days, I used to be a library where people come to borrow books. I now discovered anybody who can buy books should not be given book. If all your money ends on clothes, you are a beggar. Go and write it down. You will never become anything. If it is kingdom leadership you are looking for. The day I met Reverend Numa Obad, I came with fire. I dropped my seed, waiting for impartation. The man says, sit down. You don't think you are the first I've seen? I've been here for more than 60 years. He asked me, how much is your library? That was when I discovered I didn't even take stock of my library. I now understood why these men are where they are. You see Uma Akbar and you say, ha, ah, anointed evangelist. He said, my library is worth 55 million. My library is worth 55 million my library so he has forgotten the shoes he bought he has forgotten the clothes he bought but he knows his library and he said if you want to lead your generation go and read don't just buy the book read them bishop wedeko said they wanted to when they started covenant university they needed a book the vice chancellor didn't have it they looked for it they couldn't buy it because it's no longer in the market he didn't just know he have it has it he knew the cabin where the book was in a shelf. He said, go to this library, go to this box, check this cabin. The book must be somewhere there. And they went and removed it and brought it for him to give a professor. And then you will say, how did this man become like this? They sold into their lives. They started buying books when they were very young men. They read them, they kept them. Their legacy is their books, not their bank accounts. They know that their bank account is a byproduct of their library. This is a generation where men invest in nothing. You say you are a businessman. How many summits have you attended? You want to be great? 
you will carry your last savings instead of buying a suit you will go and pay for a business summit you will enter that convention sit down for those who have made it to talk to you you will learn things that you will never find anywhere that's why he said buy the truth sell it not i remember 12 15 years ago even when i was serving i carried my last cash to travel to lagos from worry for uh, christ embassy cell leaders conference in fact that leaders conference we went i told pastor sonny join me in lagos ask him what happened to us we didn't have money it was the last money i saved i sent him transport he met me in lagos when we closed we didn't even know the brother we called that will sleep with his house was very far we were in Ikeja. he said he's in oyingo i said where's oyingo that was my first time in lagos he said enter bus going to my two where's my two we asked for money there's no money god helped us we scavenged money together even him didn't eat on his way while he was coming thank god for discipline when they stopped in Ore, some people will sit there and say, bring one chicken there. Bring a mort. If we had eaten like that, we would have been stranded. That was how we put money together and we went and stopped in Onyimbo. It was in that conference, we started calling friends. Oh boy, I beg, send money over there. SOS, SOS. And some people gathered money, sent to us so that we can attend the conference every day. When we finish, go to Wari, go to Makodi, was a body. My friend had to talk to some of his friends to give us money to transport ourselves back because we were looking for knowledge looking we were searching for knowledge the next time we came again this time transport was no longer a problem we have learned something and in that conference pastor chris said one tree a forest Shapa. Makorua kata. that was when the revelation of of dominion entered me one tree can become a forest i said what he said in the natural it may be difficult but when the anointing comes upon your life one tree can become a forest it put dominion in my spirit i told myself i cannot fail i can enter a city as one man i will take it over because i traveled with my last cash to go listen to a man who has caught something and today my people know this work we are doing i can live here in two years hand it over to somebody else and enter another city i don't need anybody from here to follow me i caught the revelation one tree a forest more than 10 years ago and so i can enter any city as i stand there check me in three months you will find many trees standing because i caught it i caught it i didn't read it in a book i paid the price to seek the one that had it and i caught it from him he said follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise you must pay the price to search for truth you must pay the price to pursue knowledge that's what makes you it's called sowing and reaping how much have you invested in your destiny your destiny is so broke your destiny is so poorly funded because every seed God gave you, you turned it with bread and you ate it. Ask my wife, she will tell you, since we started EJMI, I have no savings. Because it's your investment in the vision that gives it relevance. You see LED screens, you see lights rolling, you see presents every day in a meeting. You think it comes cheap? It's investments. Terrible investments. From finances to prayer to study to waiting upon the Lord. We don't come here just because we are gifted. We came here because we have planted things in the soil that germinates and become the fruit that the generation feeds on. If we were to weigh the value of your vision now, how much investment has entered? Have you not watched movies that are poorly funded? The whole movie is in three rooms and one car. They will go and show the bridge of Lagos and enter the room. How many of such movies do you see on Netflix? If it's poorly funded, it goes nowhere. But when you see a movie that is all over the place, check. They have put billions of dollars in it. And because they invested in it, they can recover that money in one month. Investment, sowing, reaping. It has to do with timing and sacrifice. Sit down. Between 2012 and 2017, if there's a day I didn't fast, I can count them. They are few. Every day, morning to evening. You fast in the morning, you break in the evening. Fast in the morning, you break in the evening. There was a time it looked as if my intestine was beginning to decay. Those days, it was the one who brings sweet for me every day. I will brush my mouth to still be smelling. I fasted and fasted until my intestine, gases literally began to come out through my mouth. And I say, we must touch this power. Because that was the period people were dying in my family. 
I ran to everybody. Nobody would respond. Everybody was too busy. And I told myself, are you not a man of God? We began to drill into this thing. Invested hours, days, months, and years into fasting. Five years, six to six every day. If I didn't fast, I can count those days. There are not many. And suddenly, the death did not just stop. Something broke out. Because you can't sow into a vision and it doesn't speak. It's not possible. You cannot sow into a vision and it does not speak. Ask them, they will tell you, carry my laptop. You will see 1,000 messages from Bishop Oedeko. 1,000 messages from Pastor Chris. One th I loaded these messages. I sat on them. I chewed on these messages. That's why I can quote them. There was a time when I could pray in tongues like they prayed. I chewed these things until it engulfed me. Every written document by Kenneth E. Hagin, I gathered them together to study them. Those who know me will tell you, we didn't appear here. People who didn't know us, they just discovered us six, five, five, six years ago. They thought we, we, we rushed out. You are joking. Do you know the quality control system of the spirit? How many ambitious men are making global impact? If it's just about ambition, do you know how many persons will be shining? They look at you, they say you're ambitious, you are in a rush. Because they don't know your story. And then you know how naive they are. You go and become ambitious and appear. If you think it's that cheap. No vision speaks without adequate sowing. It's a law of productivity. And for sowing to take place, timing and sacrifice must become imperative. Number three, the third protocol of impactful and productive living is irrigation. Remember, we are using the principles of a farmer. Irrigation. At this level, you become the manager of your vision. Manager. And there are three things about managing your vision. Number one, you protect your vision. Many people allow their vision unguarded. There are many wicked men in this world. The Bible said to subvert a man in his course, the Lord approved not. You know what that means? Apart from the fact that God won't let men sabotage it, it means there are certain men that their ambition in life is to frustrate and destroy other people's visions. You don't need to do anything to them. They just hate you because you are impactful. They just hate you because you are relevant. And so they try to pour their bitterness on you, pour their bitterness on what you are doing. There are many persons who will take it upon themselves to destroy what you are doing. They study your life to trace mistakes that you are making, to talk about it and discredit you. And if that is not working, they come out to discredit you or to cast as passion on your person. That's why you must pay the price to guard your vision. Watch over it. Don't allow anybody because of bitterness, envy, or jealousy destroy your vision. It's your responsibility to guard it. Like a mother hen guards her cheek. That's how you must guard your vision. Don't let anybody come to sabotage it. There are two ways to guard your vision. Number one is to guard your heart. You know why? The things men do, the devil knows it has a direct impulse on your heart. And if your heart is corrupt, your priesthood is corrupt. So the first way to guard your vision is not even to guard the vision first, it's to guard your heart. You will hear things that people will say. If you hear them, you will be so embittered. Sometimes you want to respond. But if you respond, you have lost focus. And so in order not to distract yourself from where God is taking you and turn to start responding to people, you have to guard your heart. Guard your heart. Stay in God's presence. Allow the presence of God to rest upon your heart and to incubate it. And then cut off anything, anything that brings distraction to you. The other time, somebody wrote something. And some of the people working with me came and showed me and said, see what these people wrote. I said, forget it. It's not relevant. It's not relevant. Leave him. And so those who work with me now know. Come, make any silly comment. They delete it. You are not worthy of response. Why do we waste our time responding to somebody who is talking from bitterness and envy and ignorance? Delete it. If he insists, block him and face those who want to grow. There's no time. Don't show me those things. I don't need them. Bishop Oedeko said many years ago, he came home and they were watching TV at home and said, see what the media is saying about you. He said, it's not about me. They close, close, the video, close it. The principle is no retreat, no surrender. Don't respond to them. Ignore them. They are not important. If they are important, they too will be making headlines. If you know you are important and what you know is relevant, leave the comment box. Meet us where we are making impact. That's where we talk. There's a way we talk there. You know the way we talk in this corridor? 
will meet you face to face and say, sir, this is what you said. What do you mean by this? How about this? And then we iron things out. We shake hands like gentlemen and we face our vision. How many people of relevance have you caught responding to people in the comment and making crazy statements? They don't have that time. And so don't jump into the comment box, rest box responding to somebody who is inconsequential. If he thinks what he knows is important, let him join us in making impact. Don't distract yourself. Guard your heart. First, stay in God's presence. Saturate yourself with the word. And secondly, disconnect every distraction. Don't hear them. They are not necessary. They are not necessary. They are not necessary. It will distract you. It will corrupt your priesthood. It will bring bitterness to your soul. And you don't want to be bitter against anybody. Bishop Oedipo told the story. He said, they came and told him the other day that one pastor said this and this against him. He said, don't call his name. I don't have the time to start hating anybody. I want to see every pastor and shake them and laugh with them. I don't have that time. There's too much to do to start putting somebody in the heart. It's a weight. Put aside every weight that does easily beset you. Run the race with patience. Run it with patience. If you start hearing those things, even your message will be corrupt. When you are preaching, you will talk to somebody without knowing because there's bitterness. So stay on your lane by guarding your heart. That's the first way to guard your vision. The second way to guard your vision is to build security checks around the vision itself. Don't let it to be porous. Matthew 21, 33. See what happens. <laughs> oh yeah. He said, hear another parable. He said, there was a certain builder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and did a wine press in it and built a tower. <laughs> There's a watchtower where the guy sat and is watching. Watching, watching. If you don't have that power in the spirit, corruption will enter what you are doing. Ask them that are here, they will tell you. I can be at home and call a director and say, remove this person. I saw something. Straight, it's gone. Until God tells me to rest, remove him. We are not playing here, sir. It's a watchtower. You pick it in the spirit. You can be ministering. I'm coming, I hear you. Five seconds, I say, this person is in the flesh. Allow him to sit down for two months. I'd rather have one person in the choir than to have ten people who are kind Remove him immediately. Not because you hate him. He must catch the frequency. So while you are praying for him and interceding for him, he is going through a process. You don't watch the vision. It will crumble. And when God comes, he will hold you responsible. I gave you five talents. What did you do with it? I gave you two talents. What did you do with it? I gave you one talent. What did you do with it? It's called watching over the vision. The vision must work. And the way you watch over it is to build a tower. You have a business. You go home and sleep like all your workers. You are joking. A wolf in sheep clothing will soon enter and destroy that business. When they are sleeping, go to the place of prayer. As you are praying about the business, promptings will start coming into your spirit. Those promptings can come around policy check. Those promptings can come around character check. Those promptings can come around even the general operation. And then you come back and you gather your board of directors. And you say, listen, this, 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 let's re reprogram this like this and like this. It's a checker. And it will remove those who are not supposed to be part of it. Because many will destroy it. Guard your vision. Guard it. That's how you become productive. It's called irrigation. Don't throw seeds into the soil and go to sleep. This service I'm preaching in this night. I told somebody to preach today. But I, I laid down, I was praying. My spirit was troubled. What is happening? I checked the person. Nothing is wrong with him. And I was praying. And the Holy Ghost said, it's not yet time. As I walked into this, I immediately I carried my Bible and started looking for a message. I caught the message that showed up. I'm talking now. It's called guard your vision. Nothing is wrong with the person, but it's not yet ready. Give him some time. That's why I'm preaching now. I wanted to rest myself for the UK invasion next week. But it's not yet ready. And it was late to get somebody else. I checked. If not, you walk into the service and you will sit here and you will start saying certain things that is not supposed to say and it will bring reproach it will take you six months of priesthood to remove that reproach from the face of the calling and if you are not sensitive it happens three four five times and suddenly what god has put on you will go down and you will not know why that's why many businesses fail 
There's a manager who is there insulting everybody. But you can't pick it in the spirit that this guy is not interested in what you are doing. You know? He's just exercising his ego. He will destroy your business. You can't see it. Even when the workers complain, you can't pick it. Because there is no sensitivity, no priesthood. You are not a watcher. Every vision that thrives, there is a security system. And that security system is a watcher. It's the work of a watcher. Thank you for watching. Please kindly like, comment, subscribe, and turn on your notification bell so you always get notified whenever we post a new video. And don't forget to share. Thank you.